What's up everyone, Jay's Two Cents here. We're gonna move forward with some Ryzen coverage here regarding cooling because cooling is one of those things that uh, even if you aren't overclocking your computer, you can never go wrong with having more cooling than you need. So why even you know chance it? Which is why the stock coolers that typically come with your CPUs, they're good for testing, they're good for getting the system up and running, but usually people will opt to get an inexpensive tower cooler like the Hyper 212 Evo from Cooler Master or even an AIO, something like NZXT or Fractal Design, Cooler Master, whatever, because they just want a little bit more cooling than what stock can offer them. But AMD, when they, re when they launched Ryzen last year, launched the Wraith cooler, which was just getting rave reviews, I almost said Wraith reviews, rave reviews as to being a great factory cooler. Well, this year they stepped it up with the 2000 series even further and offered the Prism cooler with the 2700X. So today we're gonna use the Prism cooler and see just how much cooling you're actually getting with it and can you even overclock by using the stock cooler. Typically that's a big fat no-no, but today we're gonna do a yes, yes, and we're gonna try it out. The new Cooler Master H500P Mesh White provides maximum airflow, sleek design, and elegant tempered glass giving you the ultimate platform to show off your next build. Learn more about the new H500P by heading to CoolerMaster.com. So they're actually including the Wraith Cooler with the 2600X, which previously this is what you got with the 1800X, which was the top tier, the top dog of the stack. But now the 2700X is the top dog, as you can see. I suck at unboxing. It is a clearly different cooler. And I have already tested this cooler. That's why you're not gonna see the stock thermal paste on here. Um, I will be using some of the Cooler Master Master Gel Pro, just a basic thermal compound, probably very comparable to what would be pre-installed as you can see right here. But if we go ahead and take a look at both of these coolers, you can see that the Wraith cooler is very similar to kind of like how the Intel cooler is. It's just a big aluminum chunk with all of these heat fins carved into it and it's got a copper core, and then you've got a fan. Yeah. So you got a fan right here that blows down through this. The air comes through the fins and then goes out the sides, which actually offers a little bit of cooling to your RAM and your power delivery as well. That's why these downfire coolers are actually pretty good. When you've got a tower cooler kind of mounted here on the motherboard, pulling air through the side, the air never really makes it down to the components which means you've got to have good case cooling in mind when it comes to cooling the power delivery and the heat sinks around it. But when you've got this down fire cooler like this, you can see as the air comes out the bottom, then you get good cooling for the components around it. But if we take a look at the prism cooler here, you'll notice a couple of extra things. One, we have got a copper base and one, two, three, four copper heat pipes. Now the heat pipes are gonna give you better uh, transfer of heat to the heat sink or the fins themselves. The fins do nothing but offer surface area to give more spread of the heat, allowing it to absorb more heat. And then the fan, again, fires down through all of these fins, giving you better cooling, uh, again, for your motherboard components. One thing I'm not a fan of though with this cooler already, as you can see, it retains the factory super annoying clip style. Uh, I would kind of wish that they had used the old style here, which has these screws that screw down on the back plate on the motherboard. I wish they'd found a way to do that with the prism cooler, but I digress. So I, I guess they're assuming a lot of people are going to definitely hang on to these because they've invested the money to make it RGB and to also improve the amount of cooling that this can offer so that you don't have to add more money to your budget to get your system up and running. You have a cooler that will get the job done out of the box. But you know what we gotta do now? We have to test this to see whether or not it truly does get the job done. Well, it didn't turn off immediately. That's a good sign. <laughs> Had enough of that last week. Ooh, shiny. Oh. <laughs> Nick, you broke it. Okay, so you guys remember that last video where we killed our SSD? Yeah, that was totally on us. We've talked to Corsair. It turns out somehow, some way, we have no idea how it happened. And some of you guys have already figured it out. It was the wrong SATA cable. And the problem is the box it came from was from a PSU, we haven't used in over a year, so we have no idea how it got put in the wrong box. So I digress on that. That was totally us that killed it. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's important to say, but here we are, all factory settings. It's currently sitting at 4.1 gigahertz. Remember this has the new Sense MI, which is gonna try and look for a self overclock, kind of like uh, how GPU boost works. And we're gonna just kind of keep an eye on temps and see what happens. The fan curve is also set to the standard factory fan curve. So that's something else we can do too. We can play with the fan curve a little bit to see where we go. But it's also important to note 
we drop down to 3.975, which is still an overclock from the base. I believe 3.7 gigahertz is the base. So it, it is applying a little bit of an overclock, but it's still lower than when we were with the, with the water cooler. The water cooler, when we did our last video of overclocking, actually went to 4.075. So we're about uh, 100 megahertz slower than we were getting with just putting on an air cooler or a water cooler. So that's something worth keeping in mind. So the test is getting ready to finish here. We're at 89%, but our temperature has locked at 68C. Now, based on what I hear with the acoustics of the fan, it still doesn't sound like it's at 100%, but it has totally kept it at 68C, 3,950 megahertz across the board, 1.3375 volts. You know, I think I'm gonna skip the turbo setting altogether, and I'm just gonna set the cooler at 100% to see what our, with factory settings, what our lowest temperatures are. And then of course we have to see how far we can bump up the overclock to where the cooler is just no longer adequate. Also remember we are in an open air test bench. So this is the best case scenario. The only thing controlling the temperature of the CPU at this point is the cooler's own capability. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put this fan to 100%. Yeah, it's loud. Does the RPM run at 100%? Uh, almost 4,000 RPM. So it's a blender at this point. I kind of want to stick a piece of paper in there. <laughs> Something worth pointing out is look, our core speed is higher. So we might see our temperature still reach the same temps as before, but we're going to get faster clocks as we're doing it. Cause look, we're at 4.0 across the board or before we were at 3.950. We are indeed getting faster core speed by just turning up our fan curve. And the test is uh, finished now. So crazy enough, it was only not even one C lower. Now, yeah, you guys could probably argue like, well, Jay, you left all of the auto overclocking features on, you know, you left Sense MI on, so that's not really a fair test. Well, I think it would be unfair for me to turn that stuff off because no one's gonna buy this chip and go and turn that stuff off. That's why people buy this stuff is the advanced, you know, Ryzen features and self overclocking and all of that. But now the real question is, can we actually push the clocks and the voltages with this running on its max speed. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm going to leave it at max speed and I'm going to see how far we can actually go. We're just gonna adjust our multiplier ratio here. The crazy part is I know I can't hit 4.2 without going up to like 1.42 volts, but we wanna see where, this, where the limits are of this cooler. I'm not sure 4.2 is gonna be doable, to be honest. All right, the moment I hit render, 56, 57, 58, 60, 61. Oh. Yeah, it locked up. It locked. I didn't think that was gonna happen. So you know what we gotta do? Or I thought that was gonna happen. So you know what we have to do next is bump up the voltage. Okay, here we go, 1.38 volts. We got a little bit farther. Last time we froze way down here. All right, we're gonna go to 1.4. What do you think? Just go straight 1.45 and then pull it back? We'll, we'll just do it, we'll just do it. I think it's just gonna, I think it's just gonna go straight to like the 80s and then start to throttle. And we are already at 75, 76, 77. No, 4.2 all the way across the board. 90.75. This still says 4.2 though. Like, I don't think it is throttled yet. I'm gonna do this mid test and see what happens here. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Opening up task manager was just enough. What do you think, for the sake of science, just try 1.5? If I blow it up, I promise I won't ask AMD for another one, I'll just buy it. 97.5. <laughs> Is task manager gonna work right now? Funny, task manager like bricks it. <laughs> so I wanna compare the core speed and see if it's really throttling. Okay, so I think we got our answer. We can't match AIO performance with the Prism cooler. But I think you'd have to agree. The Prism cooler is doing a pretty darn good job considering the task that we're throwing at it. I'm gonna let it cool down a little bit and then we're gonna take it off and see what the spread did. Okay, well, I mean, it's not terrible. You know what we have to do now to really make this a valid test? I mean, we should probably throw on another air cooler real quick. What do you think? So I'm gonna use the Noctua, what is this? The NHU12S SE-AM4. It's actually a specific cooler that was designed for Ryzen during the first launch. But one of the things that I actually really like about this cooler is one, yes, it has the heat pipes, obviously, but it's got a base on here, which is very, very flat. You can see it's reflective like a mirror, which gives us better uh, contact with the cooler, but it also doesn't use the stupid plastic retaining brackets that I told you I hate. It takes these pieces of crap off and then it uses its own mounting system so that you get just the best torque and mounting 
uh, possible as you drop them all over the floor and then probably lose them. See, last time we hit what, 95 or 96C before it crashed? So the test is about to finish 90.25. But you know, the, the impressive side to this though is that this Noctua cooler was only about 5C cooler, uh, 5C cooler than the Prism. So what can you take from this video? This is a lot better than the Wraith cooler. I wouldn't even try this test with the Wraith cooler. Something else that's important to keep in mind too though is most people are not gonna be running the loads on their system like Blender. I mean, we all, I think there's a lot of people out there that are aspiring content creators, but most of the time things like gaming, regular surfing of the internet, light workloads are not gonna put this kind of heat into your system. Under gaming, uh, I don't know, let's find out real quick actually. But you can see right here, it's locked at 34.88. Like it hasn't moved at all, which is, Kind of crazy. So, and we're still running 1.5 volts. But guys, that was just us kind of taking a look at the Prism cooler here to see how well it actually performs. The Wraith cooler made a heck of a splash last year, and it looks like the, the Prism cooler adding RGB flavor and giving us uh, some pretty decent cooling headroom. I did not expect it to be within 5C of the Noctua cooler. I really didn't see that coming. So guys, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get out of here. Let me know if there's any other content you want us to cover for Ryzen. I saw your last video with a lot of your comments and we'll definitely try and incorporate as much of that as possible. But if you're looking to uh, do some minor overclocking with your Prism cooler on your 2700X, definitely capable. And as you go down the stack and there's less cores, the cooling only improves. And this is also a worthwhile cooler for any uh, AM3 or AM4 CPU. So including your bulldozer, your FX CPUs, you know, your, your pile driver stuff like 8350s, 8370s, because it uses that factory retention. So as much as I hate this bracket, this little clips, it actually gives it more compatibility with older CPUs. So we're gonna go guys. Thanks for watching today's video. Make sure you let us know how you thought about this video down below. If you think we did something wrong or we should have tested it in some other way, definitely let me know and we'll try to improve our methods. And uh, if you guys are new around here, why don't you hit that subscribe button. And as always guys, we'll see you in the next one.